The chapter of 12. The Mia of Ezred. Christmas was coming. One morning, mid-December, Hogwarts awoke to find itself covered in several feet of snow. And the lake froze solid, and the Weasley twins were pushed bewitching several snowballs so that they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. <laughs> few, few owls managed to battle their way through the stormy sky to deliver mail. Had to be nursed back to health by, to, by Hagrid before they could fly again. No one would wait for the holiday, could wait for the holidays to start. While Gryffindor common room in the great hall had roaring fires, the drafty corridors had become icy and bitter wind rattled through the windows of the classrooms. Worst of all, with Professor Snape classes down in the dungeons, where their breath rose in a mist before them, and they kept their clo as close as possible to their cold, hot cauldrons. I don't feel sorry, said I do feel sorry, said Draco Malfoy in potions class, for all those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. He was looking over at Harry as he spoke. Crab and Goyle chuckled. Harry, who was measuring out powdered spine of lionfish, ignored him. Malfoy had been even more unpleasant than the unusual since the Quidditch match. Disgusted that Slytherin had lost, he had tried to get everyone laughing at how wide mouth tree frog would be replacing harry as a seeker next then he realized that nobody found this funny because they were also s impressed with at the way harry had managed to stay on that bucking broomstick so malfoy jealous and angry had gone back to taunting harry about having no proper family it was true. Harry wasn't going back to Privet Drive for Christmas. Professor McGonagall had all come around the week before making a list of students who would be staying for the holidays, and Harry signed up at once. He didn't feel sorry for himself at all. This would probably be the best Christmas he's ever had. Ron and his brothers were staying, too, because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. When they left the, du the dungeons at the end of potions, they found a large fir tree blocking the corridor ahead, two enormous feet sticking out from the bottom, and a loud puffing sound that told them that Hagrid was behind it. Hi, Hagrid. Need some help? Ron asked, sticking his head through the branches. Nah, I'm all right. Thanks, Ron. Would you mind moving out of the way? came Malfoy's cold drawl from behind them. Are you trying to earn some extra points for money, Weasley? Hoping that gra the gamekeeper yourself when you leave Hogwarts, I suppose. But the hut of Hagrid's must seem like a place, a palace compared to what your family's used to. Ron dived at Malfoy just as Snape came up to the stairs. Weasley! Ron let go of the front of Malfoy's robes. He was provoked, Professor Snape, said Hagrid, sticking his long, hairy face out of behind the tree. Malfoy was insulting his family. Be that as it may, fighting against, against Hogwarts rules, Hagrid, Snape said silkily. Five points from Gryffindor Weasley. And be grateful it isn't more. Move along, all of you. Crab and Gorab, Malfoy, Crab and Goyle, pushed roughly past the tree, scuttling Neils everywhere and smirking. I'll get him. Ron said, grinding his teeth at Malfoy's back. One of these days, I'll get him. I hate them both, said Harry, Malfoy, and Snape. Come on, cheer up, it's nearly Christmas, said Hagrid. Tell you what, come to me to see me at the Great Hall. Looks great. It looks like a treat. It looks a treat. So the three of them followed Hagrid and his tree off to the Great Hall. Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick were busy with the Christmas decorations. Ah, Hagrid, the at last, the tree! Put it in the far corner, would you? The hall looked spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung all around the walls. No less than twelve towering Christmas trees stood around the room and sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. How many days you got left until your holidays, Hagrid asked. Just one, said Hermione. Oh, and that reminds me, Harry, Ron. We've got half an hour before lunch. We should be 
in the library. Oh, yeah, you're right, said Ron, tearing his eyes away from Professor Flitwick, who had golden bubbles blossoming from his wand and was trailing them over the branches of the new tree. The library, said Hagrid, following them out of the hall. Just before the holidays? Bit keen, aren't you? Oh, we're not working, Harry told him brightly. Ever since you mentioned Nicholas Flamel, we've been trying to find out who he is. You what? Hagrid looked shocked. Listen here, I told you, you drop it. It's nothing to you with that dog's garden. We just want to know who Nicholas Flamel is, that is all, said Hermione. Unless you'd like to tell us and save us the trouble, Harry added. We must... We must have been through hundreds of books already, and we can't seem to find him anywhere. Can you give us just a hint? I know I've read his name somewhere. I'm saying nothing, said Hagrid flatly. Just have to find out for ourselves then, said Ron. And they left Hagrid looking disgruntled and hurried off to the library. They had indeed been searching for books on flannels over, ever since Harry had let it slip. Because now, how else were they going to find out what Snape was trying to steal? The trouble was, it was very hard to know where to begin, not knowing what Flamel might have done to get him in the book. But Harry, but he wasn't in the great wizards of the 20th century, or notable na mad magical names of our time. He was missing, too, from important modern magical discoveries and the study of recent development of wizardry. And then, of course, there was the sheer size of the library, ten thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles that she had decided to search while Ron strode off down a row of books that started pulling them off the shelves at random. Harry wandered over to the restricted section. He had wondered was been wondering there for a while if Lamar wasn't somewhere in there. Unfortunately, you needed a special, a specially signed note from one of the teachers to look in any of the restricted books. And he knew he'd never get one of those, so that was where the book containing the powerful dark magic never taught at Hogwarts, and only read by older students studying advanced defense against the dark arts. "'What are you looking for, boy?' "'Nothing,' said Harry." Madam Prince, the librarian, brandished the feather duster at him. You better get out, then. Go out. Wishing he had been a bit quicker and thinking up some story, he'd left in the library. He, Ron, and Hermione had already agreed they'd better not ask Madam Prince where they could find Flamel. They would be sure she'd be able to tell them, but she, they wouldn't risk Snape hearing what they were up to. Harry waited outside the corridor to see if, if the other two had found anything, but... He hadn't been very, wasn't very hopeful. They had been looking for two weeks, after all, as they'd been only odd moments when between lessons. It was surprising they'd found nothing. What they really needed was a nice long search without Madame Prince breathing down their necks. For five minutes, Ron and Hermione joined him, shaking their heads when they went off to lunch. You will keep looking while I'm gone away, won't you? Her said, asked Hermione. And send me an owl if you find anything. And you could ask your parents if they know who Flamel is, Ron. It would be safe to ask them. Very safe, as they're both dentists, said Hermione. <clears throat> Once the holiday had started, Ron and her Harry had been having a good time thinking about Flamel. They had a dormitory to themselves, and the common room was far emptier than usual. As they were able to get good armchairs for the fire, they sat around eating anything they could sp spare with a toasting fork. Bread, English muffins, marshmallows, plotting ways of getting Malfoy expelled, which were fun to talk about even if they wouldn't work. Ron also started teaching Harry wizard chess. It was exactly like Muggle's chess, except the figures were alive, which made it a lot like directing troops in battle. Ron said his very old bat was very old and battered, like everything else he owned. It was once had belonged to someone else in the family. In this case, his grandfather. However, the old chessmen weren't a drawback at all. 
Ron knew them so well, he never had trouble getting them to do what he wanted. Harry played with chessmen Seamus Finnegan had lent him, and they didn't trust him at all. He wasn't a very good player, and he kept shouting different bits of advice at them, which was confusing. Don't send me there! Can't you see the knight? Send him! We can afford to lose him. On Christmas Eve, Harry went down and went around looking forward to the next day for the food and the fun, but not expecting any presents at all. When he woke up in the morning, however, the first thing he saw was a small pile of packages in front of his bed, foot of his bed. Merry Christmas, said Ron sleepily. Harry scrambled out of the bed and pulled on the bathrobe. You too, said Harry. Will you look at this? I've got some presents. What do you expect, turnips, said Ron, turning on his own term on his own pile, which was a lot bigger than Harry's. Harry picked up the top parcel. It was wrapped in thick brown paper and scrawled across to Harry from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute. Hagrid had obviously whittled it himself. Harry blew it and it sounded like, a bit like an owl. A second very small parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclosed a Christmas present from Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. Taped to the note was a 50 cents piece. That's friendly, said Harry. Ron was fascinated by the 50 cent piece. Weird, he said. What a shape. This is money. You can keep it, said Harry, laughing at how pleased Ron was. Hagrid and my aunt and my uncle. Who sent these? I think I know who that one's from, said Ron, turning a bit pink and pointing to a very lumpy parcel. My mom. I told her you didn't expect presents, and oh no, he groaned. She's made you a Weasley sweater. Harry had torn open the parcel to find a thick, hand-knitted sweater, an emerald green, and a large box of homemade fudge. Every year she makes us a sweater, said Ron, unwrapping his, his own. And mine's always maroon. That's really nice of her, said, Ron, said Harry, trying to, the fudge, which was very tasty. His next present also contained candy, a large box of chocolates, frogs from Hermione. There was only one present left, one parcel. Harry picked it up and felt it. It was very light, and he unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery gray slithering around the floor, where it lay gleaming in folds. Ron gasped. I've heard of those, he said from a hushed voice, dropping the box, every flavor of beans he had gotten from Hermione. That's what I think it is. They're really, really rare, really valuable. What is it? Harry picked up the shiny silvery cloth off of the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron. A look of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Harry threw on the cloak around his shoulders and Ron gave a yell. Oh, it is! Look down! Harry looked down at his feet, but they were gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him and he was suspended in midair, his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head, and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, Ron said suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled the cloak and seized the letter, written in narrow, loopy writing he'd never seen before, with the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time that it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry started, stared at the note. Ron was admiring the cloak. I'd give anything for one of those, he said. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt strange. Who had sent him the cloak? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say anything else, the dormitory door flung open and Fred and George Weasley bound into Harry's stuffed the cloak quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else at the moment. Merry Christmas! Hey, look! Harry's got a Weasley sweater, too! Fred and George were wearing blue sweaters, with one large F and the other a large G. Harry is better than ours, though, said Fred, holding Harry's sweater. She obviously makes more effort for if you're not family. Why aren't you wearing yours, Ron? George demanded, come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. I hate maroon, Ron moaned half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. 
Oh, you've got a letter on yours, too, George observed. I suppose she thinks I don't, we don't know your name, but we're not stupid. I know that we're called Gred and Forge. What's all that noise? Percy Weasley stuck his head through the door, looking disapproving. He had clearly gotten halfway through unwrapping his presents, as he, too, carried a lumpy sweater over his arm, which Frog the Fred seized. <coughs> a pee for Prefect? Get it on, Percy! Come on, we're all wearing ours. Even Harry got one. I don't want, said Percy thickly, as the twins forced the sweaters over his head, knocking his glasses askew. And you're not sitting with the prefects today, either, said George. Christmas is time for family. The frog marched Percy from the, the frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to the, in the by his sweater. Harry had never in all his life felt had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of chipotles. Tureens of buttered peas, silver bolts of thick, rich gravy, cranberry sauce, stacks of wizard crackers. Every few feet along the table, these fantastic party favors were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually bought, with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats inside. Harry pulled on the wizard crackers, pulled a wizard cracker with Fred, and he didn't just bang it. It went off with a blast like a cannon and engulfed them in a cloud of blue smoke, which, while they were inside, exploded the rear admiral's hat and several live white mice up in the high table. Dumbledore had wrapped his pointed wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet, and it was chuckling merrily at the joke Professor Flitwick had just read to him. Flaming Christmas pudding followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched as Hagrid, getting redder and redder in the face as he called more wine, finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed. Her top of her hat was a little lopsided. And Harry finally left the table. He was laden down with, and, with a stack of things out of crackers, including packs of non-explodable luminous balloons, grow-your-own-wart kits, and his own wizard chest set. The white mice had disappeared, and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up as Mrs. Norris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasleys went up the happy afternoon, having, a full, having furious snowball fights on the grounds, the old, wet, cold, wet, gasping for breath, they returned to the fire Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke his new chest but set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected that he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After the meal of turkey and sandwiches and crumpets and trifles, the Christmas cake and everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much after, before bed, except sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they had stolen his prefect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging at him. The back of his mind all day, not until he climbed into bed, was he free to think about it. The invisibility cloak. Whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake and nothing mysterious bothering him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd hit the, the curtains were drawn of his four-poster bed. Harry leaned over to the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from under it. His father, hmm, had been his, this had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well, the note had said. He had to try it now on now, so he slipped out of bed, wrapped her cloak around himself, and looking down at his legs, he only saw moonlight and shadows. It was a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly Harry felt a wide awake. The whole Hogwarts was open to him. In this cloak, an excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and the silence. He could go anywhere in this, anywhere, and Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him back. His father's cloak. He felt that this time, for the first time, he wanted to use it alone. 
He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, across the common room, climbed through the portrait hole. "'Who's there?' squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quiet, quickly down to the corridor. "'Where should he go?' He stopped his heart racing, thought, and only it came to him, the restricted section of the library, where Flamel was. He set off, drawing the invisible cloak right around him as he walked. The library was pitch black. It was very eerie. Harry lit a lamp to see his way going through the rows of books. The lamp looked like it as floating through midair, and even though Harry could feel his arm supporting it, the sight of him gave him the creeps. The restricted section was right in the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope, Separated by the books from the rest of the library, he held up the lamp to the titles. They didn't tell him much. Their appealing, faded gold letters spe spelled words and languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book was dark. It had a dark stain on it. looked horrifically like blood. The hats, the hairs on the back of Harry's necks prickled. Maybe he was imagining it, but he thought... A fear a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone there who shouldn't be. He then started somewhere, setting the lamp down carefully on the floor, looking along the bottom shelf for interesting-looking book. A large black and silver volume caught his eyes. He pulled it out with difficulty because it was very heavy. Balancing on his knee, he felt it open. A piercing, blood-curdling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming. Harry snapped his shut, but the book went on and on and on, high broken, ear splitting note. He stumbled backwards, knocked over his lamp, which went out. Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridor outside. Scruffing shrieked, looked back at himself. He ran for it. He passed Filch on the doorway, Filch's pale, wide eyes looking straight through him. Harry slipped under Filch's outstretched arm and shrieked off up the corridor. The book's shrieks were still ringing in his ears. He came to a sudden halt in front of the tall suit of armor. He had been so busy getting away from the library that he hadn't even paid attention to where he was going. Perhaps because it was dark, he hadn't recognized where he was at all. There was a suit of armor rear near the kitchen. He knew that. He must be at five floors above. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night and somebody's been in the library, the restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain from his face. Whoever he was, Phil's must have known a shortcut because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer and nearer. To his horror, it was Snape who replied, Hmm, the restricted section? Well, they can't be far. We'll catch them. Harry stood rooted to the spot as Phil and Snape came around the corner ahead. They couldn't see him, of course, but it was narrow cor corridor, and they come much nearer. They'd knock it right off him. The cloak didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away quietly as he could. A door was ajar to his left. It was the only hope, so he squeezed through it, sliding beneath, trying not to move. It was to his relief he managed to get inside in the room without their noticing anything. They walked straight past. Harry leaned against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. And then they had been very close, very close. It was a few seconds before they noticed anything about the room. He was hidden in. It looked as unused classroom. Dark shapes. De the sh dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled up on the walls, upturned waste paper baskets. But propped against the wall, facing him, something that he'd look at belonged, didn't look like it belonged there, something that looked like as if someone had just put it there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, high to the ceiling, with the ornate gold frame standing two clawed feet, and there was an inscription on it carved around the top, Ezrid Stara Ethru Oit Urb Cathru Oit Anhuai. His panic fading. Now, there was no sound of Filch or Snape. Harry moved near to the mirror, wanting to get a look at himself, but seeing no reflection again, he stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth and stop himself from screaming. He whirled around to hear his heart pounding, 
far furiously, which it had been when the book screamed, for he had seen not only himself in the mirror, but the whole crowd of people standing behind, right behind him. But the room was empty. Breathing very fast, he turned slowly back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it, white and scared looking, and there, reflected behind him, were tens, at least ten others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but still no one there. Or were they all invisible, too? Was he, in fact, in a room full of invisible people? With this mirror's trick, was that it reflected them, invisible or not? So he looked down at the mirror again, a woman standing right behind him. His reflection was smiling at him and waving. Harry reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he touched her. Their reflections were so close together, but he only felt air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair, and her eyes were... Her eyes were just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass, a bright green, exactly the same shape. But then he noticed that she was crying, smiling but crying at the same time. A tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her, and he wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up in the back, just as Harry's did. Harry was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mom? He was but Dad? They just looked at him smiling, and slowly Harry looked into their faces of the other people in the mirror, and he saw pairs of green eyes like his, and noses like his, and even an old man who looked as though he had Harry's knobby knees. Harry was looking at his family for the very first time in his life. The Potter smiled and waved at Harry, and he stared hungrily back at them, his hands pressed flat against the glass, though he was hoping to fall right through and reach to them. But he had a powerful kind of ache inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. How he lo long he stood there, he didn't know. The reflections did not fade, and he looked and looked until a distant noise brought him back to his senses. He couldn't stay here. He had to find his way back to bed. He tore his eyes away from his mother's face and whispered, I'll come back. And he hurried out of the room. You could have woken me up, said Ron crossly. You can come tonight. I'm going back. I want to show you the mirror. I'd like to see your mom and dad, Ron said eagerly. And I want you to see my whole family, all the Weasleys. You'll be able to know me and the other brothers and everyone. You can see them all any time, said Ron. Just come around my house the summertime. Anyway, maybe it only shows dead people. Shame about finding, f not finding flannel, though. Have some bacon or something. Why aren't you eating anything? Harry couldn't eat. He had seen his parents. He wouldn't be seeing them again till tonight. He almost had forgotten about flannel. It didn't seem very important anymore. Who cared about the three-headed dog was guarding? What did it matter if Snape's dole it really? Are you all right? said Ron. You look odd. What Harry feared most, that he might not be able to find the mirror room again. With Ron covered with clo the cloak too, they both had more slowly ne the next night. They tried retracing Harry's route from the library, wandering around the dark passages for nearly an hour. I'm freezing, said Ron. Let's forget about it and go back. No, Harry hissed. I know it's here somewhere. They passed the ghost in the tall, which gliding up opposite direction, and they saw no one else. Just as Ron started moaning that his feet were dead and with cold, Harry spotted the suit farmer. Ah, it's here. It's just here. Yes. And he pushed the door open. Harry dropped the cloak from around his shoulders and ran to the mirror. There they were. His mother and father at the sight of him. See? Harry whispered, I can't see anything. Look, look at them. There are loads of them. I can I can only see you. Look at it properly. Come on, stand in where I am. Harry stepped aside with Ron in front of the mirror. He couldn't see his family anymore. Just Ron in a paisley pajamas. Ron, though, was staring transfixed as an image. Look at me, he said. Can you see all your family standing around you? No, I'm alone, but I'm different. I look older, and I'm... I'm head boy. What? I am... 
I'm wearing a badge like Bill used to. And I'm, I'm holding up the house. Cup for the Quidditch Cup. I'm a Quidditch captain, too. Ron tore his eyes away from the splendid sight and looked excitedly at Harry. Do you think this mirror, mirror shows the future? How can it? My family are dead. Let me have another look. You had it to yourself last night. Give me a bit more. You're only holding the Quidditch Cup. What's interesting about that? I want to see my parents. Don't push me. Sudden noise outside the corridor put an end to their discussion. They had realized how loudly they'd been talking. Quick! Ron threw the cloak over them, and the luminous eyes of Miss Norris came around the door. Ron and Harry stood still, both thinking the same thing. Did a cloak work on cats? After what seemed an age, she turned and left. This isn't safe. She might go and go and flitch. I bet she heard us and come in. Ron pulled Harry out of the room. The snow still hasn't melted from the next morning. Want to play chess, Harry? said Ron. No. You want to go down and visit Hagrid? No, you go. I know what you're thinking about, Harry. That mirror. Don't go back tonight. Why not? I don't know. I just got a bad feeling about it. And anyways, you've had too many close shaves with, already with Filch, Snape, and Mrs. Norse are wandering around. So what if they can't see you? What if they walk into you? What if you knock something over? You sound like Hermione. I'm serious, Harry. Don't go. But Harry only had one thought in his head, which was to go back in front of the mirror, and Ron was going, not going to stop him. The third night, he found his way more quickly than before. He was walking as so fast that he knew he must be making more noise than that was wise, but he didn't meet anyone. And there was his mother and father smiling at him again, and one of his grandfather nodding that happily. Harry sank down on the floor in front of the mirror. There was nothing stopping him from staying here all night, nothing at all except... So, back again, Harry. Harry felt as though his insides turned to ice. He looked behind him, sitting there on the desk and the wall, knows none other than Elvis Dumbledore. Harry must have walked straight past him. So desperate to see the mirror, he hadn't noticed him. I, I didn't see you, sir. Strange how nearsighted being individual, invisible can make you, said Dumbledore, and Harry was relieved to see that he was smiling. So, said Dumbledore, slipping off slipping off the desk and sit on the floor with Harry. You, like hundreds before you, have discovered the delights of the Mirror of Ezrid. What do you... I didn't know that what it, it was called that, sir. But I suspect you've realized now what it does. Well, it... well, it shows me my family. And it showed your friend Ron, him as head boy. How did you know? I don't need a cloak to become invisible, said Dumbledore gently. Now... Can you think what a mirror of Ezra shows all? Harry shook his head. Let me explain. The happiest man on earth would be able to use the mirror of Ezra like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into it and see himself exactly as he does. Does that help? Harry thought. Then he said slowly, It shows us what we want to see, whatever we want. Yes and no, said Dumbledore quietly. It shows us nothing more or less than our deepest, most desperate desire in our hearts. You, who've never known your family, see them standing around you. Ron, who has always been overshadowed by his brothers, seeing him standing alone, the best of all of them. However, this mirror will give you neither knowledge nor truth. Men have wasted away before it. They have entranced by what they have seen, or been driven mad. Not only not knowing, it only shows what is even real or possible. The mirror will be moved to a new home tomorrow, Harry. And I ask that you not go looking for it again. If you ever do run across it, you will be now more prepared. It does not do to dwell on the dreams and forget to live. Remember that. Now, why don't you take that admirable cloak back on and get off to bed? Harry stood up. Sir, Professor Dumbledore, can I ask you something? Obviously, you've just done so, Dumbledore smiled. You may ask me one more thing, however. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I? Oh, I myself see me holding a thick pair of woolen socks, Harry stared. You can never have enough socks, said Dumbledore. 
Another Christmas has come and gone, and I didn't get a single pair. People will insist on giving me books. It was only it was only when he was back up to bed that struck Harry that Dumbledore might not have been quite truthful. But then he thought, as he slowed or as he shoved Scabbers off his pillow, it had been quite a personal question. <laughs>